Um, in Vietnam, I know what you're asking, Leah. First of all, move the maps, but also... Do you have a map of Vietnam? Much like Korea, I have side-to-side -side maps. I'm not really sure why. Yeah, they're great maps. I decided to upside down Australian maps, to be honest. Oh, do you? All right, so in Vietnam, um, Vietnam had been occupied just forever. China had it, Japan had it, the French had it, uh, had it, um, and then uh, finally, the Vietnamese, under their leader Ho Chi Minh, who ended up becoming communist, Fight the French, fight the French, fight the French, and finally in 1954, in a battle called Dien Binh Phu, which is in uh, northwestern Vietnam, Dien, D I E N, B N B I E N, Phu, P H U. Um, in Dien Binh Phu, the French are finally defeated, and the Vietnamese are, um, are victorious. Looks like they had their freedom. But much like Lee Corso, we say, not so fast. We installed a, a, a pro-American leader named No Diem, who was pro-American. Actually, he was Catholic, uh, American educated. He was, he did not bring glory to the name of Catholicism, by the way. Um, <laughs> unlike the other 1.1 billion. Um, and we, remember we had uh, NATO, and we had um, ANZUS, and we had all these, and CINTO and stuff, all these um, security agreements. We now have another one, it's called um, CETO, the Southeast Asia Treaty Organization, that if communism spreads, we'll go all in. Now, the um, the what's the whole theory about what? Why do we care? If Vietnam is whatever. It was under the idea of the domino theory. This is the theory that was being purported to Americans as the reason why you have to stop communism in the first place. Because if we allow Vietnam to become communist. Then Laos becomes communist. Then Cambodia becomes communist. Then Thailand becomes communist. And sure enough, the Indonesian um, islands become, and then the Philippines. And the Philippines are, you know, pro-American. And now you're looking, now Japan's all by itself, and you got problems. So what's the best thing you do? Stop it in Vietnam. And this policy made some intellectual sense. Later we're going to find out when the... Um, Pentagon papers come out that most of the people in the Pentagon knew this wasn't really the case, but it was used as a justification to incite Americans to support this, um, this stuff. Americans, we had people in Vietnam in the 50s. Now, we did, not have, we did not have active, like, ground soldiers and units there, but we had advisors there, like training people. We helped, we were paying the French to fight. We were paying the French a ton of money to fight, so we didn't have to. And they lost, that was bad. Now, in reaction, we had this before, in reaction to, um, in reaction to NATO, whoa, in reaction to NATO, in reaction to NATO, uh, the communists also formed their own collective security agreement. What do we call that? The Warsaw Pact, and as you know, their official color was purple. The Warsaw Pact and Justin Bieber. Um, their, their official color really wasn't purple. What is the official color of communism? Red. Red. How did they not make it red then? Does it correlate? Um, I think it would be harder to walk, see on a map, see the names and stuff. Um, red's an awful color. Colors of schools that are not really good, like Louisville or Indiana or, or Anderson. Anderson. Or Transy or Anderson. <laughs> that one backfired. Oh, crap! Now. All right, let me, let me rewind. Now, in 1954, 53, 54, Stalin died. Yay! Do what? 
He's similar to Satan. All right. Stolen died. And what was interesting, and what was almost unprecedented, is that after the, the, the power play, the Politburo, the, the um, Soviet Union's top committee was called the Politburo. And usually the premier or the head of the Soviet Union came out of the Politburo. And the guy that's going to come out as a successor to Stalin is a guy named Nikita Khrushchev. Is he on there? Yeah. yeah. Good, because I don't want to spell his name. Nikita Khrushchev becomes the Soviet leader. And what's, a couple things about him. One, Stalin wasn't Russian. He was Georgian. Nikita Khrushchev is Russian. He was also a very working class. He was not, a lot of people in the Politburo, Politburo actually did have some sort of aristocratic ties. More wealthy families, historically. This was not Khrushchev. Khrushchev had a giant, glaring, and at times embarrassing inferiority complex. And you're going to see this play out sometimes at the UN. At one point at the UN, he gets really mad, he takes off his shoes, and he starts bashing them on the table at the UN. <laughs> Yeah. Well, he was doing it to be funny, but it, it, it came off past absurd. But what he also, and some have seen him as a great villain like Stalin, others have seen him as being more progressive. One of the first things he does is he apologizes to the Soviet people for Stalin's abuses. Obviously, he can't do this when Stalin's alive. But this is a really, really progressive step forward for the Soviet people, that he, he basically admits Stalin was awful. And nobody would admit it before because either A, they were scared to, or B, the... Uh, well, no, but just the, the, the machine that was their propaganda machine was powerful, right? The name of the newspaper was Pravda, which is uh, Russian for the truth, and it was completely state-run, right? Everything you heard was state-run. And he admits that they were lying about it, and Stalin was bad. That's a really, really big deal. And we're going to see him and, it looks like him and Eisenhower are actually going to maybe start working some things out. And something really ridiculous, unfortunately, happens. But it looks like Khrushchev can, can be working a little better. In fact, what he actually offers is something called um, peaceful coexistence. He wants to peacefully coexist with Western democracies. He said, we're going to bury you, we're going to do it economically. We're going to show you economically why communism is a better um, example of how to run a country rather than capitalism. So it looks like maybe the Cold War is getting a little bit nicer. In 1955, there is, at the Geneva Conference, um, the Soviets and Americans agreed um, that they would try to start easing nuclear tests. Now, that doesn't mean we're going to not have nuclear weapons, but this is the first time the Americans and Soviets in 55 had started considering ease, officially easing tensions. So you get, you get Stalin dying, you get Khrushchev apologizing, you get the peaceful coexistence stuff, and now you get a Geneva Agreement, um, and specifically, final specifically, um, where um, they we both um, limited atmospheric testing of nuclear weapons, which means for a long time, we're, um, after this, you know where we tested nuclear weapons underground. Um, we really don't even test them anymore. The Americans tried to get the Soviets to agree to a unified Germany. They wouldn't go that far. But they did agree to stop atmospheric testing of nuclear weapons. And while you might not think this is a big deal, to use testing somewhere else, this is a really important first step. Diplomacy is always about breaking down small barriers at a time, right? So what starts happening in Hungary is interesting. The Hungarians, specifically students, start seeing a couple things. One, they see that it's no longer Stalin's Khrushchev. They see his peaceful coexistence idea. And most importantly, they saw that America's new policy of brinksmanship was going to start getting rid of communism. So in Hungary, many of the students in 1956 start an uprising. The Hungarian uprising in 56. 
And this is going to be a really important part of Cold War history. Because this is internal. These are internal people fighting against communism. Uh, by the way, in the end, that's how communism falls. Just people just can't take it anymore. And it crumbles from within. But Khrushchev brings in tanks in the army and crushes this. So now, what under mass retaliation, what is Eisenhower going to do? Democracy was trying to flourish, and it was crushed by the Soviets. Based on mass retaliation, what has to happen? Bomb. We're taking you out. Guess what didn't happen? We didn't do it. We didn't take him out. What's the problem with a policy like mass retaliation? You can't bluff. You can't bluff. If your parents say, if you're late one more time, you're going to military school, and you're late one more time, and they're like, go to your room for one hour. What do you know about your parents? You can do whatever you want. You do whatever you want. So you can't bluff. That's why I stabbed my friend. He took a balloon. I ain't bluffing. Note to self, if Mr. Sir says he's going to stab you, run away. <laughs> With a box cutter. If he shows you the box cutter. What? I showed it to him. This box cutter will be jamming your leg. <laughs> Yeah, I, there are way there are way more restrictive laws on what I can do to students via box cutter. Um, <laughs> I thought he was a box. I'm sorry. I thought this girl sitting in this chair was a box. I apologize. She looked like a cardboard box. Right. Well, you had a UPS code on. Um, all right. So, all right. So now we get. So now we get one of the most fun parts of American Cold War history. There was a real worry about Soviet technology compared to American technology. And we're going to find out later, this was kind of a stupid thing to be scared of. But for a while, we were really, really, really scared. And then, in 1957, Soviets launched Sputnik. 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 Last two years, a couple years ago, I had Mariana Shubaruk, not in AP US, but I had her in Macro last year, and I said that. I said, how do you spell Sputnik? I say Sputnik. And she's Ukrainian, but it's close enough. She said, Sputnik. It's close enough. Well, her parents lived under communism, so they were. Um, there's like 40 different Shubarai at the school still. That's my plural version of Shubaruks, by the way. Shubarai. That would be awful. Um, so Sputnik is launched. And what was Sputnik? What was it? It, it was, they used rocket technology to launch something into space. A man-made object was not only launched into space, but also communicated with Earth. Soviet technology could launch stuff into space and then communicate with it. And this, Americans had no but Jesus left. <laughs> I don't know where my but Jesus <laughs> They All the but Jesus was scared out of them. And so in reaction, America, America put together, uh, we launched up something called Explore One, the space. Basically, it was like a metal grapefruit with two little things that went out. It was in the space and went poof. We were like, all right, we got something in space. It was a really sophisticated Sputnik. But in response to Sputnik, and then after Explore, we launched NASA. The, um, today, if you are a NASA engineer or if you're a NASA this or that, that is considered the height of your field, right? That if you say this is used by NASA, what that means is it's the coolest, right? Um, NASA is important not just because of what it represents in terms of defense and, and technology, but also in terms of possibilities, right? NASA's kind of gone from we need to beat the Soviets to the moon to possibilities for scientists. Uh, Americans are not all that wrote about NASA anymore. NASA used to, like, we when I was a kid, which was, you know, like 10 years ago, when I was in second grade and third grade and fourth grade, when they would have shuttle launches, 
it was still big enough deal in the mid 80s where my dad would wake me up and we would watch it. Today, people, you know, the last 10 years, probably even other than Columbia, when it, the tragedy, people didn't even know when the space was up in the air, right? We always knew. When Challenger exploded, we'll actually watch some of it, we'll watch Reagan's speech, after, Reagan's speech after the Challenger explosion was a really, really good speech. And we'll see that when I, you know, kids would watch, there was a, there was a teacher on that. And they had, a, they had like a competition to see what teacher would go up, and this woman won it. And I remember in third grade, we learned all the science stuff about NASA because the teacher was going up, and then everyone was watching it, what had happened. Um, the Challenger explosion was a really big cultural deal. Today, NASA hasn't become, we haven't, Explored it. Where have our technology changes been focused on? Like computers. Yeah, internal stuff, right? Personal stuff, phones, computers, businessy stuff. We haven't really looked to go to Mars or anything. People talk about it. We have not sort of done that. Um, so um, another thing they're going to pass is the National Education Defense Act. This is going to be really important because now.